Welcome to the Happiness Matters podcast with me, your coach, Julia Seal, where we explore the puzzle of whole being happiness as professional women in our midlife, how to coach ourselves and live into the best version of ourselves, resilient, creative and thriving, no matter what. Good morning and welcome to today's deep dive into our brains to explore what on earth is happening inside them while we're meditating. It's another piece in our midlife happiness jigsaw puzzle as we expand our ability to manage our brains like the supercomputers they really are. To go with these meditation episodes, I've recorded several free meditation sessions for you. They're here on the podcast stream, but you can also get them from the website happiness-matters.coach. These meditations, the show notes for this episode, all my free coaching tools and my recent live stream recordings are all there for you on happiness-matters.coach. Now before we get started, I want to point you to something new that I'm doing. You might already know that through the COVID-19 pandemic, I've been doing a lot of coaching to help with extreme anxiety and fear. More than a year later, I'm seeing a shift in what's going on for many of you. So I'm changing my quick help solution. Yes, anxiety is most definitely still there for many of you, but we're not in such a fearful place. We seem to be more concerned about what the new normal means in the longer term, in terms of returning to the office, dealing with the long-term mental health issues in your team and family, or even wanting to keep your healthy habits going as things as life begins to open up. You can now book a very special Get Unstuck session with me for $99. I know, (laughs) it's great fun, quite intense. We'll look at what's getting in your way right now and work out your first steps to clear the blocks so you can get on with creating this next phase of your life. Whether it's establishing a meditation habit in your daily life or dealing with a difficult family member who's not getting off the couch, (laughs) or looking at your career differently post-pandemic. You can book directly from the website by clicking on the yellow button called Coach with Julia. And the sessions are called Unstuck, the magic of midlife momentum. You can find a time in my schedule right there and pay using PayPal. Super easy, super useful, super fun. So come on, let's do it. And this leads me to what I want to say first today, because here's a happiness trap waiting to swallow us up. And it's got to do with this wonderful happiness habit of meditation, of calming your mind, resting your thoughts, creating headspace. I know, how crazy is that? And it's got to do with the way many of us are as midlife women. We're good at goals. Most of us are very goal-driven, used to achieving results and getting things done. There needs to be a purpose as to why we're going to devote time and effort to something. And then, with all our efforts, our efforting, we expect certain results. And this (laughs) is our happiness trap when it comes to meditation. Let me explain. Most newcomers to meditation are attracted to what they believe meditation will bring them. Calm, peace, and this is the happiness trap itself. Yes, meditation does profoundly affect the brain, and we'll talk about this today. And it has remarkable knock-on effects in our lives in the long term. But we can cancel out all these benefits by our expectations of what meditation will do for us how we should feel afterwards, how we want to feel afterwards. Generally, we want and expect to feel good, to feel calm, to feel peaceful, to feel spacious. But this expectation, this should, gets in the way of our actual practice. It gets in the way of letting our meditation experience be what is on any given day. If we don't feel calm, peaceful and spacious after a meditation session, we question ourselves. I'm doing it wrong. 
It's not working. I'm not feeling any better, so I'm going to stop. These expectations and your self-judgment about how well it's going, your need to do it right, sit right, breathe right, all of these mini rules, this goal-orientated striving do not lead to happiness or to the benefits of meditation unfolding in your life. Most beginner meditators do experience calm and peace from their meditations, and we come to expect this from the practice, getting up from our mats feeling rested and calm and content and peaceful every single time, and somehow getting cross with ourselves when it's not. And the Dalai Lama talks about his meditation very differently. And I've learned a lot from listening to him describe how on some days his own meditation practice can be really difficult. How his mind can be unsettled, jumping all over the place. And how he can get up from his mat feeling the complete opposite of rested and relaxed. What's actually most important in meditation is the consistent practice, day in and day out and how your brain responds to meditation and the long-term effects of that. In a recent live, I spoke about the types or so-called stages of meditation, mindfulness, calming meditation, insight meditation, and then what follows from here. I'm talking today about calming meditation specifically, what we get into when we first start meditation as a formal practice. I'll definitely go back and spend time on mindfulness later, but I want to spend time on basic calming meditation now because of change and coaching and how it can help us. If you remember from the last episode I did on meditation, I talked about my three long strong breaths tool as a very easy first way to begin formal meditation. And in this episode, I did touch on what this meditative breathing does to our brain waves and to our hormones. And today I want to go more into the fascination of what's going on with our brain waves when we meditate. We can actually learn to monitor our brain activity consciously. And we can switch our brain waves so that they are serving us best in any given moment. We can even strengthen certain brain wave patterns. See how wonderfully exciting it is to understand our brain design, exploring how our brain is structured so that we can use it more and more as the supercomputer it really is, instead of being mindlessly at the effect of our brains running automatically. It's so exciting. What's important to remember, and it's exactly the same for our hormones and neurotransmitters, they are all there to serve us. Some have got a bad rap in the media recently, but they're all necessary and they're all useful to us. Cortisol, for example. It's called the stress hormone as it plays a key role in our flight or fight fear response. But it's like a swear word out there. It's blamed for us putting on weight, especially that middle age spread, high blood pressure, disrupting our sleep, worsening our mood. But remember cortisol by increasing our heart rate and blood pressure, gives us energy and alertness in times of stress and danger, essential to our survival. It's the same with our brain waves. We might see high beta as what's running around when we're anxious and stressed, but it's also when we have high energy, are highly aroused and need conscious focus and problem solving. So it's really a matter of not one or the other, but if they're running in our brains when it's best for us. And we get to change this when we're working with our brains on purpose and intentionally. Now, let's look more into these patterns, these so-called waves in our brain. Whether we're mentally active, resting or asleep, our brains always have some level of electrical activity going on. And it's going on in different parts of our brain doing different things. But it's happening all the time as our brain cells, our neurons talk to each other. And this activity can be monitored by an EEG machine via sensors attached to the scalp that tune into the activity and record the patterns. These patterns are described as five EEG bands or five different types of wave patterns, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. 
<laughs> yeah, they're all Greek. <laughs> In any given situation, we could be experiencing too much or too little of the brainwave suitable for what we're involved in. There is an optimal level where we want to be in. Gamma waves occur when we're involved in intense concentration and learning, when different regions of the brain fire in harmony, such as in moments of intense concentration and insight. Beta waves are active most of the time when we have our eyes open. It's when we're listening and thinking during analytical problem solving, judgment, decision making, and processing information about the world around us. Beta ranges from high to low, high being a more anxious stress state with a busy overactive mind. Alpha waves are seen as the bridge between the external world and the internal world. Here we are more relaxed and reflective, recharging, kind of passive attention. Theta waves are quite abnormal in awake adults apparently, but very normal in children up to 13. <laughs> For us, we mostly access them in sleep, dreaming, or when we're deeply relaxed, lost in thought, free-flowing creativity, intuitive and internally focused. And the last type, delta waves, are the realm of deep restorative sleep and the deepest levels of relaxation and rejuvenation where we're accessing the unconscious. This is a quick and easy guide <laughs> to what's going on in our brain throughout the day and night. You can see how we might move between them at any stage of our day and what life might be like if our brain is not running the optimal wave pattern, like trying to get to sleep or trying to change our unhelpful reactive patterns when our brain is in high beta, wired and highly anxious. Now what's happening when we start practicing meditation and how can we use it when coaching ourselves? Typically, as we first come to rest in our meditation spot, our brain waves begin to shift from beta to alpha waves. This is what we typically think of as relaxation and rest, what's called wakeful rest. So alpha waves increase when we relax from intentional goal-driven tasks. This is typical of calming meditation, shine meditation, where we're settling down, calming down, and coming to a restful place in our minds. Also, in deep breathing and visualization and mindfulness meditation, alpha is the state of reduced stress. We might also experience more theta waves. This is the relaxed attention of more experienced meditators who are observing their inner experiences with relaxed attention. This is what's happening when we're experienced in Shine and practicing insight meditation. What we're not seeing in meditation are delta waves, as these are characteristics of sleep. So while it might look like you're sleeping sitting up when meditating, you're not. <laughs> nor are we seeing the active beta waves of problem solving and decision making and high anxiety. These changes, especially the theta waves, show up more distinctly when we're not following a directive meditation practice. As I said earlier, when we're not striving for a particular outcome or trying to forcibly control the content of our mind. Rather, we're cultivating the ability to tolerate the spontaneous wandering of our minds without getting too involved. <laughs> we're loving the monkey mind. So instead of concentrating on getting away from stressful thoughts and emotions, we're simply letting them pass in an effortless way. So how do we know this? Well, researchers have been hooking up meditators to EEGs for years now and monitoring this shift into alpha and theta waves. But some of the more robust and fascinating studies have been done with Buddhist monks by Dr. Richard Davidson, a neuroscience professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His team have long monitored monks' brains and found not just what we've been talking about, how brain waves shift from beta to alpha to theta during meditation, but they've also discovered a neural signature of permanent transformation in the brain as a result of meditative states. So proof, really, as to how meditation actually changes the brain in the long term. One of my own teachers 
Yang Yi Mingyu Rinpoche, as well as other Buddhist monks, were asked to alternate between one minute of meditation on compassion, followed by 30 seconds of neutral rest, four times in rapid succession. They discovered a couple of fascinating things. First of all, the monks all showed remarkable mental dexterity and laser-like focus, able to enter and leave the meditative state at will. Also, remarkable ease at generating compassion. Their brain circuitry for empathy rose 700 to 800 times higher than during the rest periods. But most extraordinarily, and what really wowed the researchers, was when starting the compassion meditation, a huge burst of electrical activity kicked off in their brains that lasted the entire period of the compassion meditation. A brain surge of gamma activity and something they could hold throughout the meditation. These elevated gamma waves showed up not just during meditation, but even during baseline measurements of their everyday neural activity, including when they are asleep and also right across their brains, so not only in isolated neural locations. And they showed up 25 times stronger than a non-meditator. For us generally, we can only maintain these gamma flares for a split second, A creative insight, as an example, is one-fifth of a second. It's extraordinary. The monks actually have altered the structure and function of their brains. Proof, according to Dr. Davidson and his team, that the effect of meditation is not temporary, but rather it can alter deep-seated traits in our brain patterns and characters. Wow. Amazing. There is a short Netflix series called The Mind Explained that features Yang Yi Ming Yurin Pache talking about mindfulness meditation. I'll link to this in the show notes as well as some other resources from him. He's a really interesting person to follow if you're interested as he's fun and his books and his teachings are very accessible. One of my favorites is The Joy of Living. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> The key in all of this is to know which brainwave is the optimal one for whatever you're doing and to purposefully and intentionally make the shift. Do you need more restful sleep? Are you too anxious to concentrate? Are you wanting to focus your attention on the task at hand? Meditation is one of the best tools for you to learn to work with your brain and to actively shift from one pattern to the next. For example, I find I do my best focused creative work shortly after a meditation session, but I also sleep better too. (laughs) Okay, so if you're starting out and wanting to establish a meditation habit in your midlife, you could jump on an unstuck The Magic of Midlife Momentum coaching call with me. Also download my meditations either from the website happiness-matters.coach or the podcast. They're guided and quite short, so from 5 minutes to 20 minutes. And that's easy if you're getting started. And of course, there's my favorite, three long strong breaths meditation, episode 2.3 which will walk you through switching your brain from beta to alpha waves right now, and perhaps even theta and gamma in the very long term. (laughs) I hope you'll jump right in and sit for five minutes now and see what happens to your brain. What's happening in your brain? What waves is your brain creating at the start of meditation and again at the end? Let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And as a reminder, if you're new to the podcast and feeling a bit lost, start here. That's easy. (laughs) Series one was all about how you're defining happiness in your midlife. Series two is all about brain management and the four corner puzzle pieces of midlife happiness. Brain design and meditation, body as brain and life patterns. If you do want more detail, an easy way in is to listen to episodes 2.0 and 2.1. May you be happy. May you be free. There is no better time to coach together. 
Bye for now. It's time for me to stop chatting to you and sit down on my mat to see what's going on inside my own brain. <laughs>